In Iowa, a state of vast agricultural land, water is a precious and at times abundant resource. Our cities and towns were often founded next to waterways, and rivers thread throughout hundreds of miles from border to border. But changes to our land and our climate could impact our relationship with water in Iowa. In Cedar Rapids, a town that was devastated by flooding in 2008 looks to its past while building for the future. Along the upper Iowa in northeast Iowa, a free-flowing scenic river lures visitors to towering 100-foot bluffs. Near our state's capital city of Des Moines, river systems are confronted with environmental challenges and planners utilize man-made dams to determine the future of water quality and flood control. Our state's relationship with cities, towns, and waterways are the central focus on this edition of Iowa Land and Sky. Funding for Iowa Land and Sky provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. The Resource Enhancement and Protection Conservation Education Program. To fully capture the waterways of Iowa and the relationship with cities and towns, the best vantage point may be from above, as Iowa Public Television takes you on an aerial view of river systems and waterways from across the state. There are economic and quality of life benefits to being in a river city. There's also an increased risk of flooding. Just ask Cedar Rapids residents and officials after the devastating and historic flood of 2008, when the Cedar River overflowed its banks and swallowed up businesses and homes downtown and in several neighborhoods. Managing how water flows through an urban area like Cedar Rapids is an ongoing challenge, especially as there are more frequent heavy rain events and aging infrastructure can't keep up. In terms of our storm sewer system, throughout the city we have a, connect a connected network of open ditches, closed storm sewer pipe, um, and areas, and eventually the vast majority of those come to the Cedar River, and not very many of them are gated off. So the Cedar River is generally our lowest point. All of that water has to fall by gravity and get to the Cedar River. Um, the problem is that when the river comes up, that water starts to backflow up that, sand, that storm sewer system. So as that storm sewer system fills, we can actually see flooding not just what you can see from the banks of the river, but as it's going through our low areas and filling up that storm sewer and, and flooding out into the streets through the storm sewer system. The city has installed gates on some storm sewers that can be shut during high water events and they've built new pump stations that can then pump water from the low areas back into the river when those storm sewer gates are closed. You always have that fear, uh, particularly since 08 for Cedar Rapids, that we could flood again, and that's a, a big burden for the community. Cedar Rapids is not only concerned with rainfall and water flow within the city, they have to monitor the entire Cedar River watershed, and they're at the mercy of what happens to the north. A hundred years ago, farm, no farm fields were tiled, so all of that water you know, sat in those low areas of those farm fields as opposed to running off. So as we see more and more of those farm fields being tiled, uh, we see more and more of that water getting, not only just getting to the river, but it's getting there faster. Uh, what's really helpful to us, what we rely on, is a series of gauges that are on the river all the way upstream. So at any point in time, we can monitor the elevation um, the flow and how fast the river's coming up, not only in Cedar Rapids, but in all those points upstream, uh, which helps us be able to kind of predict what's going to happen here based on what was predicted in cities upstream from us and what actually happens there. The city participates in several groups that work on initiatives to better manage the watershed. There's a lot of discussion of regional detention basins and larger detention areas to hold that water back, as well as restoration of, of native areas. So 
if you have a, you know just a large area that is grass that water is going to travel across that grass a lot faster than it would if it was native material so if it was longer native grasses no mow areas that more of that water is going to sit there and be absorbed there um, and again that'll delay the time that it takes to get to the rivers now it's not change that's going to happen today um, it's really you know steps that we're taking today that will hopefully improve for for generations to come that we can keep improving on that those efforts not only help with the quantity of water, but the quality of water too, by filtering out some pollutants before they get to rivers and streams. Building codes have changed too. Developers used to be able to put buildings or concrete on 100% of their property. Now codes force them to include detention basins or other measures to hold some of that water on their property and limit water runoff. What we have tried to do to kind of go above and beyond that is to put incentives in place to encourage existing properties to do the same. So um, encourage existing properties to take up pavement that they don't need and to put a detention basin in, or if they're redoing a parking area to put permeable pavers in. So permeable pavers look like pavement, uh, but the water actually infiltrates down through there and it can be stored underneath the pavement. Um, again, so you're reducing the amount of water that's running off and there's also some water quality if you can filter that water as it goes down through the system. We have to protect ourselves, but we also want to make sure that the amenities that we put in are amenities that can benefit the public. So that's one of the strategies we've had. So, you know, mention our amphitheater. Our amphitheater serves as flood protection but it also, 99% of the time, serves as an amenity for our community. The trail systems that we're gonna build, the levees with trails on top of those levees, all these are amenities that are gonna take this infrastructure investment and assure that it's something that the community can really benefit from. The city acquired and cleared more than 1,000 homes in harm's way after the flood of 2008 and created green space for the river to breathe. A nearly $750 million plan is being carried out in the next 10 to 12 years to fully protect Cedar Rapids from future flooding. There are more than 1,600 small watersheds in Iowa, draining water off the land and moving it through the state, much of it ending up in either the Mississippi or Missouri rivers. In recent decades, changes in farming practices and urban development have had significant impacts on our landscape. We had a very sponge-like landscape, you know, over a hundred years ago before we came in and drained it, uh, tiled it, and put drainage ditches in uh, areas. And so that water held back and of course it mitigated against droughts as well as, you know, mitigated against, you know, heavy rainfall and flood conditions. If there's too much water or if it moves through the watershed too quickly, we can experience flooding. There have been more than 1,000 presidential disaster declarations in Iowa due to flooding in just the last 30 years. Now I think we're getting people to understand a bit more that these floods are here to stay and we've got to start doing more. Um, individuals can do something at the parcel scale um, by trying to do the right things. But I think um, for us to really make progress in the state, we've got to start changing policy. That includes water quality issues, Iowa Watershed Approach estimates there's $10 billion of work to do on flood mitigation and water quality in Iowa. And that's just to get started. 50 years ago, when we were losing topsoil at an unacceptable rate in Iowa, the Soil Conservation Commission came into Iowa and worked with landowners. And in 50 years, we changed the way soil came off our land. We could do the same thing with water and nutrients if we had the political will to do it. We could make progress uh, towards this 50-year goal of reducing flooding and improving water quality in Iowa. It's unlikely that we will ever see the federal government build another large reservoir and dam in Iowa, like Sailorville, Red Rock, or Coralville. So the Iowa Watershed Approach is focusing on helping Iowans complete smaller projects within watersheds, like wetlands, building more farm ponds, restoring floodplains and oxbows, even bioreactors. The benefits are twofold, help control flooding and improve water quality. I would suggest that we're at a crossroads in the state, that we've got to start doing more and we've got to do it with much greater urgency. We need to have balance between our agricultural, economic, water, natural, and human resources. You know, we want the state of Iowa to be a state that people want to come to 
they want to work here, they want to raise a family here, and they want to recreate. And, you know, they want to enjoy, you know, our natural world, and they want to enjoy, in, a lot, in many cases, you know, our, you know, waters of Iowa, our rivers, lakes, and streams. Thousands of river miles run throughout Iowa, a state bordered by the Missouri River on the western rim and the Mississippi River on its eastern side. Iowa's cities and towns encompass a state defined by its waterways. So a watershed is an area of land that drains to a common point. Two very different watersheds in Iowa, the Raccoon River and the Upper Iowa, are a perfect example of our state's unique characteristics. Well, the Raccoon River is really three rivers. It's the North Raccoon, the Middle Raccoon, and the South Raccoon. Uh, the North Raccoon being the biggest. Uh, the confluence of the three is just west of Des Moines near Van Meter, Iowa. In west central Iowa, a sprawling combination of rural counties and the state's largest urban center, Des Moines, collectively make up the North Raccoon River watershed. In this watershed, more than 80% of the land is held for row crop production with a rotation of corn and soybeans. The land is tiled, a process of creating an artificial water control system under the soil. It's similar to gutters on a home, sending water away from the land and preventing corn and soybeans in otherwise marshy areas to maintain optimal moisture levels. A lot of the ground there in the Raccoon watershed is very suitable for uh, cultivation of corn and soybeans. Uh, we have a lot of drainage tile in that watershed. And so uh, along with the fact that we have a fair amount of uh, livestock production, especially in the northern part of the watershed, that all uh, figures into the stream having a high nitrate level. Then probably the most special part of it is it's a major source of drinking water supply. Agricultural tile is prominent at the northernmost headwaters of the Raccoon River. Here in Buena Vista County near Marathon, Iowa, a collection of metal pipes run water into a channel. These pipes begin the North Raccoon River's long journey past Storm Lake, farm fields, countless communities, and inevitably to downtown Des Moines where nitrates in drinking water are filtered out at the Des Moines Water Works. So the Raccoon probably has the highest nitrate concentration of any stream of its size in North America. Drainage tile is the primary delivery mechanism for nitrate from farm fields to the stream network. The Raccoon River watershed contrasts with that of the Upper Iowa River watershed in Northeast Iowa. The Upper Iowa winds through miles of high limestone bluffs. While its headwaters are in Minnesota, it eventually empties into the Mississippi River. Along the way, the Upper Iowa runs through varied karst topography and the nearby town of Decorah. Karst topography is known for its easily dissolved bedrock that leaves behind limestone. Its existence in this region lessens the amount of available topsoil and limits how much land may be used for crop production. Well, the Upper Iowa is draining uh, the what we call the Paleozoic Plateau, and we've never really had glaciers in that part of Iowa. And so we have a thin layer of topsoil there, and drainage tile, like we have in central Iowa, is, is really much less necessary up there. When the water percolates through the, the soil profile, it gets to bedrock much more quickly uh, in the upper Iowa River watershed. Also, the, the materials in the riverbed there tend to be rockier and sandier than say the raccoon where we're gonna have more silt and clay uh, material. And so all these things factor in, into water quality. While the upper Iowa nitrate loads are less than commonly found in the Raccoon River, this Northeast Iowa watershed still confronts water quality concerns. Across Iowa's 99 counties, multiple watershed approaches and specific watershed plans are utilized to confront water quality concerns such as high nitrate levels based on sound science, as well as regulatory and voluntary initiatives that attempt to engage stakeholders to achieve an ultimate goal, safer and cleaner water. 
Back in central Iowa, efforts to reduce nitrate loads are part of a watershed approach designed to increase nitrate monitoring data with real-time sensors paired with state and federal funding to modernize drainage tile and add buffer strips to absorb nutrients. To date, current efforts have not substantially altered a long-term trend of higher nitrates in the Raccoon River watershed. If you look at the money we're investing uh, through cost share programs, it's a tiny, tiny fraction of what we need. And so, you know, how much do we want to solve this is the basic question. You know, that money has got to compete with all these other things that we want, roads and schools and so forth. And so as a society, do, do we want to solve this or not? And I think that's, that's a basic question here that we don't know what the answer is. Geology, the weather, all of these things uh, does not conform to political boundaries, but it does conform to these natural boundaries like a watershed boundary. And so that's why it's important for us to try to manage our water resources on the watershed scale and not so much the state scale. Watersheds and water quality impact every corner of Iowa. The potential solutions confronting land use, urban use, and voluntary versus regulatory measures will likely determine the watershed approach in the 21st century and Iowa's water quality for decades to come. While the Des Moines River originates in Minnesota, it passes many of Iowa's communities and its capital city of Des Moines before eventually merging with the Mississippi River in far southeast Iowa, near Keokuk. A history of seasonal flooding and meandering river sections was adjusted in the mid-1900s by two massive dams that control the Des Moines River and give Iowans a pair of important tools in the fight against flooding. Dams were authorized for flood control primarily, so that's our primary mission. Uh, that's why the dams were built, to protect downstream cities, towns, things of that nature. And then along uh, with the flood control comes secondary authorizations such as recreation, environmental stewardship, low flow augmentation for downstream, as well as water supply. Water flowing through the heart of Iowa's midsection along the Des Moines River is heavily controlled by a pair of commanding man-made reservoirs. The concrete structures dating back more than a half century hold back tremendous amounts of water. Sailorville Dam, only 11 miles north of Des Moines, can hold water more than 50 miles upstream and across the Des Moines River Valley. Its 6,700 foot long main dam was authorized by Congress in the late 1950s and fully operational by 1977. Sailorville has played crucial roles during historic Iowa flood events in 1993, 2008, and as recently as 2018. Here at Sailorville, um, we have a major constraint point down at, at uh, Southeast 6th Street, which is just south of where the raccoon comes into the Des Moines River. And so here back a few weeks ago when the Raccoon River was, was flowing pretty high, uh, we had actually cut back our outflows here uh, because we were going to exceed the flood stage down here of 26 and a half feet. And so um, once the Raccoon settled down, um, then we could open up the gates here at Sailorville some more. Our primary mission has stayed the same for flood control. And uh, we operate the dams based off a approved water regulation plan, which, which dictates how much water that, that we let out to maintain our pool. And so every day we get instructions from, uh, from Rock Island District, from our engineers there, uh, who also work in conjunction with the Natural Weather Service um, to formulate what the forecast is going to be. And so, and so we have gauges all up and down the river system, all the way from southern Minnesota, all the way down to the mouth of Mississippi. And so those gauges are looked at every day, as well as the precipitation that has actually fallen, and then what the forecast is for, for precip in the next 24 hours. And so all that data is, is combined to give us a, a, a forecast. And so we know what's coming into the reservoir, and then we know what to let out of the reservoir to maintain our pool. Further south along the Des Moines River Valley rests the largest lake in Iowa, Red Rock. 
Near the towns of Pala and Knoxville, Red Rock Dam helps hold back water covering a potential surface area of 70,000 square miles. Both reservoirs work, you know, work under the same plan. Now we have different tables as far as what we can release because Red Rock is built differently than Sailorville is. Uh, Red Rock can handle a lot more water than we can. They have a different uh, gate structure than we do. And so Sailorville is somewhat limited as far as how much water that we can let out at once. So, for example, our conduit, the, the maximum outflow that we can get is, is 21,000 cubic feet per second. And in order for us to get that high outflow, the lake has to be at elevation 880. And so the lake has to be pretty high for us to be able to get that kind of water out. And so that, that can be challenging at times, uh, you know, especially when we're in a, in a flood fight mode. Both Sailorville and Red Rock were authorized in the mid-20th century as Iowans and the federal government sought to tame river systems across the Midwest, including tributaries of the flood-prone Mississippi River. Both Sailorville and Red Rock have created ample recreational opportunities with camping, boating, and parks lining the shorelines. But their history and future will certainly be intertwined with flood control. The entire watershed has changed you know, since, you know, since these dams were built. You know, we know that, that we're getting more water into the, into the watershed, you know, from storm events, from, from stronger storm events, from, you know, changes in, in uh, farming, from just growth. You know, cities are growing, there's more, you know, concrete and asphalt, and so all that contributes to more water getting to us faster. Iowa's climate is, is very interesting and, and somewhat unique because we're positioned in the middle of the continent, but that we have water to our south in the form of the Gulf of Mexico. And this has a profound effect that keeps us from being like other, many other mid-continent regions that are really quite dry. So we have a source of moisture, particularly in the summertime, our growing season, which means that we have this very favorable condition for uh, growing crops uh, in our state. What is climate? Climate is what we expect based on records and data of weather conditions over several years or decades. Weather is what we get in the short term. When measurements like temperature, precipitation, wind and humidity vary significantly for an extended period, that's what we call climate change. And the data shows climate change is happening in Iowa. Something in our climate is changed from what it was. Grandpa didn't have to deal with these issues back on the farm then. They didn't see these soggy soils all during the spring. One of the most notable changes in Iowa's climate is increased frequency and intensity of heavy precipitation events. We're seeing more flooding. The state's average annual rainfall has gradually increased. But between the 1870s and 1950, Iowa had just two years with more than 40 inches of rainfall for the year. From 1950 to the early part of this century, it happened eight times. We also have much higher humidity levels. That fuels convective thunderstorms that provide even more precipitation. It's like uh, getting a bigger can of gasoline to throw on the fire, so to speak. And, and so that's what's happening, that there's more of the ingredients that drive these uh, large rain events of six and seven inches, which in the first half of the 20th century, these were really very rare events. But now we're not amazed anymore by hearing these because we have the ingredients that are favorable to those kind of de uh, extreme events developing. We've experienced warmer average winter temperatures and cooler summer temperatures in recent years. That's expected to change in the next couple decades. The maximum, daily maximum temperatures in summer have actually gone down. We have fewer days above 100 degrees than we had 50 years ago. And that's because of this additional rainfall that we have that is suppressing the warming because of all the water on the surface that the sun is uh, evaporating. So instead of heating the air, it's using that energy to evaporate water. So as a result, our air temperatures haven't increased. Our humidity has gone up a lot. And after a while, we have to uh, think about how vulnerable are these natural processes to what we 
really uh, cherish in our state and what drives our economy. So that's where we're starting to learn more about these, these natural services and how they might be impacted by climate change. Iowa was shaped by millions of years of geologic forces, and our state's vast agricultural land is heavily dependent on water, a precious and at times abundant resource within many communities. Our cities and towns were often founded next to these waterways, and rivers thread throughout hundreds of miles from border to border. Our relationship with water, both its quality and its flood-prone nature, may define Iowa's story in the 21st century. The hundreds of river miles that weave throughout Iowa define our state and make up the view of Iowa land and sky. Funding for Iowa Land and Sky provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. The Resource Enhancement and Protection Conservation Education Program.